thin film interference is going to be the topic of this lesson in my new general physics playlist, which when complete will cover a full year of university algebra-based physics. Now this is the second lesson in a chapter on wave optics. We just covered double slit interference and we'll find out that there's some other interference that is possible when you've got a thin film of a liquid. Uh, and if effectively you've got two reflected rays that have a chance to either constructively or destructively interfere with each other depending on the case. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. Perhaps you can recall when you were a kid that your parents would overpay for a bottle of soap so that you could blow bubbles. So, and if you remember looking at those bubbles and you had them out in the sun, let's say, and stuff like that, and you change the angle and stuff like this in your perspective, and they would start changing different colors on different parts of the bubbles and you'd see different colors. And the question is, well, why is that? Where's the, where are those colors coming from? Well, it turns out it's due to what we call thin film interference. So. So that, that really thin bubble actually does have an actual thickness associated with it, and you're getting reflected rays coming off the top interface, the top of the surface, and the bottom of the surface, and those two reflected rays have a chance of either undergoing constructive interference or destructive interference. And it turns out if you're hitting it with white light, which is like light from the sun or light from the lamps in this room, or think of this sort, that's white light, which is all the wavelengths, it turns out depending on the thickness of that soap bubble, so, some wavelengths will be just the right wavelength that constructive interference happens and those colors are amplified. Other wavelengths will be just the right wavelength that destructive interference takes place. So, and instead those colors are eliminated. And so this amplifying of some colors and eliminating of others is why you see certain colors but not others on that soap bubble and things of this sort. So let's take a look a little bit more closely and see what's going on. And so we're gonna take a look at a couple scenarios. So one is kind of the more common scenario where you've got some gas, a little thin film of gas floating on water. And so uh, you've got air on top of gas on top of water. One you're probably not gonna encounter but will be instructive for us is when we've got a, a layer of water floating on uh, a liquid of carbon tetrachloride. So it turns out that carbon tetrachloride is nonpolar, water's polar, they don't mix the same way that water and oil don't mix. But the big difference here is that carbon tetrachloride is more dense than water and sinks to the bottom, if you will, so that the, we can form a thin film of water on top of it. So I picked these two examples for a reason, as we'll see. So ultimately what's going on, though, is that white light, which again is a combination of all the colors, so it's gonna be entering from the air into this water here. And we wanna focus on just one color for a second. So it doesn't really matter which color. So we're gonna focus on the light rays incident from the air into the water and see what's going on. So I'm gonna exaggerate these angles, FYI. So the angles, so relative to, you know, this incident angle right here relative to the normal is a lot smaller than what I'm gonna be able to draw. But if I made it you know, small enough, like you know, 0.25 degrees or something like this, we really couldn't discern anything on a board like this. So I'm exaggerating all my angles here. So here we're going from a lower index of refraction to a higher index of refraction. So the refracted ray is gonna to bend towards the normal, but you also get a reflected ray where the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. So you get both reflection back into the air, but also refraction so that some of that light enters the water. We're factoring both of those. Well, now we wanna look at this interface as well. So, it, and in this case, I don't really care about the refracted ray. Yes, re both reflection and refraction are gonna take place at this interface between the water and the carbon tetrachloride as well, but I'm only concerned about the reflected ray. So if you're wondering, Chad, why didn't you draw the refracted ray? Because it's not relevant, that's it. So in this case, we're gonna get the reflected ray and the angle of incidence will equal the angle of reflection. So, and then once again, at this interface, you do have the potential for some more reflection to take place back so into the water and stuff like that. And I don't care about that either because it's irrelevant to the phenomenon we're studying here. So, but we'll have refraction again, but in this case, we're going from a higher index to a lower index. So the angle of uh, uh, refraction is gonna get bigger and it's gonna bend away from the normal. 
And you see, we now have these two parallel reflected waves. One was reflected at the top surface of this thin film of water, and one was reflected at the bottom surface of this thin film of water. So, and these two rays right here, there's a chance they're exactly in phase, in which case constructive interference takes place and whatever color of light this is gets amplified. But there's a, ch a chance they're exactly out of phase as well, in which case destructive interference is gonna take place and that color is gonna be eliminated from the re reflected light coming off this thin film. Cool, now a couple things are gonna factor into this. So one, the thickness of the film is gonna be relevant. So the indices, the relative indices of refraction are gonna be in a bit, but also what wavelength of light we're talking about. And in white light, we've got all the spattering of colors again. And we'll find out that again, some of those wavelengths are gonna undergo constructive interference, some destructive, just depending on what thickness of the film we're dealing with. Now, one other thing we need to understand real quick, a little review on waves on a string. So if we had a string fixed at one end and we sent a traveling wave towards the fixed end, fixed at a wall right here. So when it hits the wall, well, the wall's immovable. So, and the string's inertia ends up uh, leading to a, a reversal, an inversion of that wave. And so it gets inverted on the way back. So here it was in the positive Y direction on the way there, it's in the negative Y direction on the way back. Well, it turns out that light waves do something similar sometimes. So when light goes from one medium to the next, so again, you have both reflection and refraction. Well, for the reflection, and this would be analogous to reflection here, for the reflected ray, if the light, so it was going from a lower index of refraction to a higher index of refraction, then the reflected ray is inverted. However, if the light's going from a higher index of refraction to a lower index of refraction, then the reflected ray is not inverted. And so sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. So keep that in mind. That'll have some relevance here in just a little bit. All right, so we wanna take a look at these two reflected rays and find out what, is, what are the conditions for these two reflected rays undergoing both either constructive or destructive interference. And we gotta take into account this inversion. So here we're going from air to water, a lower index refraction to a higher index refraction. And that means that this reflected ray is going to be inverted relative to the incident ray. So keep in mind, so this is an inverted ray, okay? So, but we come down here and this reflected ray right here was going from water so to carbon tetrachloride, a lower index or higher index, and it gets reflected as well. And again, this is only something we have to worry about with reflection, not with refraction. But the key is this, both of these reflected rays have been inverted relative to the original incident ray, which means are they inverted relative to each other? No, they're not. They're both inverted relative to him, but relative to each other, and that's gonna be what's of chief concern here. So the two reflected rays, how are they related? There's been no inversion relative to each other because they were both inverted relative to the incident ray. And so the way I wanna mark this is I wanna say that here there is no phase shift between these reflected rays. They've both been inverted, but relative to each other, there's no change in, in phase, if you will, between them because they've both been changed. So no relative change, I guess is how I would say that. All right, so that's kind of the idea there. So in this case then, we, we see that one of these light rays has traveled further than the other. So one is reflected immediately, but one has had to travel through the thin film of water and then back before also entering back into the air where it can interfere with these. So, and we learned in the last lesson that when there's a difference in path length, if that difference in path length is equal to uh, a whole number of wavelengths, constructive interference can take place. And when that path length, that difference in path length, I should say, is equal to an odd number of half wavelengths, then destructive interference can take place. And so if you recall, if this difference in path length is equal to a multiple of wavelengths, we'll get constructive interference. But if this difference in path lengths is equal to a odd number of half wavelengths, then we'll get destructive interference. Well, the question really comes down then is how much further did this light ray have to travel than the one that's just merely reflected at the top surface? Well, and again, it's not gonna look like this, but again, I've had to exaggerate how big these angles are. These angles are really small. They're not exactly on the normal, but they're not far off the normal. And so the distance this light ray travels is effectively the thickness. 
So on the way down anyways, the thickness of this film, and it technically would be just ever so slightly higher because it is going at a slight angle, but it's not too much bigger. Again, these angles are very tiny. And so it's the thickness going down and the thickness going back up. And so that overall, the difference in path length is that this light ray right here has traveled two times the thickness of that film further than the one that was reflected at the top surface. And so here, two times that thickness would equal a multiple of wavelengths to get constructive interference, or two times that thickness would equal an odd number of half wavelengths leading to destructive interference. And so depending on the thickness, as well as depending on the wavelength, so uh, some of these light, particular colors of light will be uh, experience constructive interference and some destructive interference. Now here's the deal though. So here we went from, you know, if we look, we went from lower index to higher index to even higher index. But in this last example, which is a, a more common example you're likely to encounter, we go from a lower index to a higher, higher index of refraction back to a lower index of refraction, and that's gonna change some things. So we're gonna get the same processes happen. So first ray comes in, you get reflection and you get refraction because we're going from a lower index to a higher index, it bends towards the normal. And then at this interface as well, both reflection and refraction take place, but I don't care again about the refraction, so we're only gonna focus on the reflection. And then here again, reflection and refraction could take place too, but I only care about the refraction that makes it out back into the air. All right, and then again, these two reflected rays, again, this one's had to travel further, but these two reflected rays could again experience either constructive or destructive interference. But now we have a problem. So if we look at the first reflected ray, it's going from a lower index to a higher index. And does that mean uh, there's a, a phase shift? Does that mean uh, it's gonna be inverted in phase just like we saw here? And yes, it does. That happens when you go from a lower index to a higher index of refraction. So this is gonna get inverted, undergo a phase shift, so to speak. So, but then the next reflected ray is going from a higher index to a lower index and no inversion takes place. And so for ultimately for these two reflected rays, one's been inverted, one has not. There's a phase shift relative to each other that has taken place. And this is a more common example you're likely to encounter, but that's gonna mean some big things. So now if the distance, the excess distance in path length traveled, so is exactly equal to a multiple of wavelengths, that would actually ultimately mean that now that would mean they're out of phase because they're inherently out of phase if the distance traveled as a, as a multiple wavelength or if the distance happened to be the same somehow magically. So because of the inversion of one of the reflected rays and not the inversion of the other. And so now this con normal condition of constructive interference is exactly wrong. And so now if you look over here, so when 2t equals m lambda, that's your destructive interference. And when your 2t equals m plus one half times lambda, that's now the condition of constructive interference. And so if you go from low to higher to higher, all of a sudden your normal conditions for constructive and destructive interference that you think totally apply. But if you go from low to higher back to lower, all of a sudden now everything gets reversed for your conditions for constructive and destructive interference all due to the fact that one of the reflected light rays again was inverted and the other was not. Whereas here they were both inverted and so there was no phase shift relative one to another. So cool, that's it though. This is, this is the equation we're gonna be using. So, and it's from here though, it's plug and chug. You just have to know which one of these situations you actually have. Let's do some plugging and chugging. Now before we get to the problem of interest, there's one key piece of information I failed to mention. Uh, that I definitely want to bring up, and it's all about this wavelength in these equations. So if you recall, as you go from one medium to the next and you get a different index of refraction, the speed of light changes. And recall that the index of refraction is equal to the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum relative to the speed of light in that particular medium. Well, also recall that the speed of light was equal to frequency times wavelength. And turns out your frequency is not changing as you go from medium to medium, it is the wavelength that is changing. And so like in this example right here, you've got air, you've got water, you've got carbon tetrachloride. And if the wavelength of this light is different in all three mediums, well then which one are we talking about? Well, it is the wavelength inside whatever your thin film is. That is the wavelength you need to plug into these equations. The wavelength in the film.
All right, so that's key. One other thing to note then, if you look at your index of refraction, it's equal to the ratio of the speed of light uh, in a vacuum over the speed of light in a medium, and that would equal the frequency times the wavelength in the vacuum over the frequency times the wavelength in the medium, which in this case is the film. Well, the frequencies again don't change, so those cancel, and so it's really just the ratio of the wavelength in a vacuum with the wavelength in the film. And if you rearrange this, so you can solve for the wavelength in the film, as equaling the wavelength in a vacuum over that index of refraction. So the reason I give you this is because it's real common for you to be provided wavelengths either in a vacuum or air, which are effectively the same numerical value. So, and as a result, then you're gonna have to calculate the wavelength in that film before you do the plug in and chug in, which is gonna be the case here. So now let's get to the problem of interest here. And the question says, what is the minimum non-zero thickness of a layer of gasoline, N equals 1.40, floating on water, n equals 1.33, if violet light, wavelength in a vacuum equals 420 nanometers, is eliminated from the reflected light by destructive interference. So if you notice, it's the second scenario is the exact one we have. We have a thin film of gasoline on top of water, and so it's air on top of gas on top of water as our path. And so uh, we've already done this one, so we know there's gonna be a relative phase shift between the two reflected rays, but if we hadn't already done it, you'd have to figure that out. And you have to be like, okay, so the light's gonna go from air to gas, lower index to higher index, first reflected ray, it's gonna be inverted. So, but then you're going from gas to water, which is higher index to lower index. And so the second reflected ray is not gonna be inverted. Since one reflected ray is inverted and one is not, there's a relative phase shift between these two. And this is now the, construct, uh, the equation for uh, constructive interference. And this is the condition for destructive interference which is the relevant one in this question. We want destructive interference when there's a relative phase shift as we just determined. And so here 2t is gonna equal m times the lambda in the film. Rearranging that, t is gonna equal m lambda in the film divided by two. Well, the lowest value of m, the lowest integer you can plug in is zero. But again, the question asks for a non-zero answer because kind of intuitively, if you plug in a zero here, you're gonna get a thickness of zero. If your thin film has a, thic a thickness of zero, it means you don't have a thin film. So the smallest it could really be then is one. Mathematically zero works, but one's gonna have to be it. So in this case, your wavelength, we're gonna have to figure that out. And so in this case, the wavelength in the film, is gonna equal that 420 nanometers over the index of refraction of 1.4. So, and you can probably do this in your head because 42 divided by 14 is exactly three. And so 420 over 1.4, plug it into your calculator, it's gonna be 300 nanometers. Now one thing to note, you could be like, hey, we gotta put this in SI units, and by all means, 300 times 10 to the minus nine meters is 3.0 times 10 to the negative seven meters, and you could do that. So however, for a multiple choice question in this section, it's really common for these thicknesses to be supplied in nanometers because all the wavelengths of visible light are typically supplied in nanometers as well. So just a word to the wise. So I'm gonna calculate this still with nanometers, but you could definitely do it with meters and the answer would come out in meters in such case. But if I used nanometers, then the answer is gonna come out in nanometers as well. And the math is pretty simplistic here. So 300 divided by two, that thickness is 150 nanometers. Cool, note that is not the only thickness that would be possible for this kind of destructive interference to take place. It's just the smallest thickness where m equals one. If you plug in m equals two, two times 300 over two would be 300 nanometers. You get the same destructive interference there. Three times 300 over two would be 450 nanometers. So and it ultimately becomes all multiples of 150 nanometers. 150, 300, 450, 600, 750, 900, uh, nanometers would all be thicknesses where we'd see this exact same destructive interference of this violet light. If you found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.